Hello. 19 years ago, NATO was waging its first ever war in the form of an air campaign called Operation Allied Force. Commanders went into this war believing that they just had to do a 72-hour air power demonstration. It turned into a 78-day effort and a remarkable phase for NATO. The CFAC during this time was Lieutenant General Mike Short. He's an Academy grad. Sadly, he passed away in October of 2017. I wanted to show you this slide just to remind you of a few things about General Short. He was known as a real fighter pilot, a man with a quick temper, and a big heart. Some of the quotes you see here were tributes paid to him after his death. I particularly like the one that says, boy, you knew where the bar was and you had to exceed it. The quotes also talk about the feeling of those who flew with him and didn't want to disappoint him or bring down his wrath because General Short held everyone to very high standards. And most of all, for many of us who got, had some contact with General Short, he had a very, very big heart. This embodied in his relationship with his family and in his concern for those he commanded. General Short is also very uh, remarkable for having had two children serve in the Air Force. Brigadier General Christopher Short, who is now in London, and Colonel Jennifer Short, both fighter pilots. Shortly you'll hear from General Jumper, and he'll talk about what this campaign took, and about the role of General Short, and about his own role. And to transition to that, I wanted to show you this quote from something General Short said many years ago in reflecting on the Kosovo campaign. And that was that Kosovo was a great success story for airmen. This was an air power only war, but as he said, you will never know the time that General Jumper spent flying top cover for me. And with that remembrance of General Short, I'd like to go on to the next slide, please. And use this to introduce a man who whatever job he was in, was always looking towards the future. Even among his peers, General Jumper's breadth of vision really stands out. And as I looked across his bio, a lot of things jumped out at me. Of course, he uh, was educated at VMI. He was a fighter pilot with Vietnam time, flew the F-4, the F-15, flew the F-22 as the chief of staff. But I think the only way to convey to you how unique and remarkable his vision has been at every stage of his career is to take it backwards. So let me introduce General Jumper to you. He is currently the CEO of the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia. Prior to that job, General Jumper was president and chairman of the board of SAIC, a major defense contracting corporation. During that time, SAIC split into a company called Lidos. He was also president and chairman of the board of Lidos. Prior to that, he served as Air Force Chief of Staff. Prior to being Chief of Staff, Air Combat Command. Prior to that, he was commander of the United States Air Forces in Europe. Before that, he held that key three-star position on the air staff in the Pentagon that was once called XO. It's the operations deputy's job. Before that, he commanded 9th Air Force in a time period when General Jumper was instrumental in setting out what it meant to be an expeditionary air force. The concept of an AEF is something that was very much pioneered by General Jumper as he, as 9th Air Force commander, looked at what it took to break the Air Force into pieces that could be deployed to a continual operations. Before that, as a three-star, and now moving backwards, he served as a military assistant to not one but two secretaries of defense, Wes Aspen and Dick Cheney during the Gulf War. Were you here this morning to hear General Horner's story about the biospores and the difficulty of targeting biological weapons targets in Operation Desert Storm? Well, back in Washington, General Jumper was helping to work some of those issues for Colin Powell, Dick Cheney, and others in Washington. I hope that look back at General Jumper's career gives you a sense of what you are in for. A tremendous treat as you listen to General John Jumper tell us about Operation Allied Force. General Jumper. Thank you, Rebecca. It's great to be back together uh, again with you. We started 20-some years ago in the Pentagon working together, and uh, Rebecca and I have been able to work together for 
several occasions among, along the years, and it's a pleasure to share the stage with her. It's also a pleasure to uh, share this uh, symposium with my fellow airmen, uh, teachers, mentors, and uh, good friends over uh, many decades uh, in the Air Force. Um, Dave Deptula, thanks for putting this together. Uh, the Mitchell Institute um, and this center here for uh, character and leadership development. Uh, I'm going to take just a minute to talk about the importance of that. Uh, I gave a um, I gave the commencement address at my alma mater, VMI, several months ago, and the title of it was wish I, "What I Wish I Had Done Differently." It's been referred to on the stage here already this morning. I was an electrical engineering major. Uh, I didn't do much uh, other than te highly technical things uh, while I was in, at VMI. And as I progressed through my career, it became evident to me how little I knew about the formation and foundation of our own nation, certainly how little I knew about the nations and countries I was coming in contact with. Um, and it was a great hole in my education that I severely regretted. Um, and had to work hard to catch up. Uh, I noticed that many of the cadets here today that I've talked to are in the, uh, taking courses in international studies, uh, studying for, foreign languages and the like. That is important. Also put on your list, take the time to learn about the formation and foundation of your own nation. Learn about the people who emerged at exactly the right time in history to form a nation that has propelled us to where we are today and to appreciate the fact that as ugly as the politics and the divisiveness gets, we do have a system that allows us to argue, to debate. And if we think it's bad now, you can think back to the days where they used to get mad at each other and call each other out for a duel and shoot one another back in the early revolutionary period. Put that on your list. Make yourself know and understand about your own nation. We're going to talk about Operation Allied Force. There's a lot of things that have been said that, uh, already this morning that uh, uh, apply to, uh, to, to my case study. Operation Allied Force was a continuation of what Hal Hornberg talked about. It was a continuation of genocide propagated by Slobodan Milosevic, one of the consummate evil bad guy figures uh, in history. Uh, in response to this genocide, uh, NATO attempted to negotiate a deal. The negotiation broke down, and in late March of 1999, Milosevic deployed some 40,000 Serbian troops into Kosovo, again, for the distinct, with the distinct mission of eliminating a class of people. So from the 23rd of March, 1999, to the 10th of June, Operation Allied Force took place. We flew some uh, 38,000 sorties. We had about 1,000 airplanes involved, some 30 ships, some 13 NATO nations um, participated. We opened 18 bases in the area. Uh, we deployed in um, using, generally using the principles of the newly conceived uh, Air Expeditionary Force. Uh, and it generally worked with some uh, notable exceptions. The result, 78 days later, was uh, UN Resolution 1244, which is, essentially kicked the Serbs out of Kosovo and, uh, uh, and reserved autonomy for Kosovo and, and, and stopped the, the hostilities. Although, when you look at the history of that part of the world, which goes back to the Battle of Skulls in 1399, uh, there is no uh, force, contemporary force, that's going to erase the hatreds that have evolved over the, uh, over the centuries in that part of the world. We started off as um, Rebecca noted, we started off with this notion that we would do just a demonstration of air power. And this demonstration would so frighten Slobodan Milosevic that he would fold like a cardboard suitcase and it would all be over very quickly. The objectives of NATO, the strategic objectives, were the same as we were trying to negotiate before the hostilities. Uh, end the aggression, kick him out, uh, establish a framework for uh, follow-on government, etc. Uh, but what happened 
although we got there in the end, what happened in between is actually uh, quite interesting. The actual strategy turned out to be uh, an attempt to deploy the minimum amount of power we thought we could get away with to do this sort of three-day demonstration. And then um, the uh, commander of uh, Supreme Allied Commander uh, Europe was then hoping that uh, we could make a case to put ground forces in. There was no appetite to put ground forces in. And this demonstration uh, was not going to work. We were making this, I was trying to make this uh, clear from the, from the start. Mike Short was uh, commander of the CAOC in Italy. Mike was trying to make a force list and trying to get forces deployed in and establish relationship with the NATO nations, uh, all of whom wanted to be in the CAOC. The CAOC was the center of gravity for what was going on. And uh, Mike was trying to establish those relationships I was at Ramstein as the commander of US Air Forces Europe, uh, attempting to help get the logistics squared away and make things easier on Mike Short so he could do his job. Uh, neither one of our jobs became uh, very easy as it turned out. Um, we had a very restrictive target list to start with. They had to be military targets, so they were barracks, etc. cetera. Uh, we exhausted that target list in about three days. Uh, and then uh, the worm turned on the Air Force to say, you hit all the targets and you didn't get the work done. Uh, actually, there was no strategy, no framework, and this is when we began to argue uh, forcefully for a strategy that would actually work. And the strategy that would actually work was based on the ability of uh, air power to help convince the people in Belgrade, the middle class of uh, Serbian population that uh, they needed to go to their leader and ask and challenge him as to exactly why they were sacrificing their middle class lifestyle for whatever this thing that was going on in Kosovo. You may recall, if you watch the news clips, that during the demonstration period, the population of Belgrade went out on the bridges. They uh, were dancing and partying. They were uh, wearing uh, t-shirts with targets on them and sort of daring us to do something about it, I think leaning on the experience from uh, our experience in, uh, in Bosnia, thinking that we were so, uh, we were so shied by uh, civilian, uh, injuring any civilians that we would not uh, dare challenge uh, uh, their presence on the bridge. In fact, the way the uh, terrain works out in the capital, in order for most of the people to get to work, uh, they have to cross one of several bridges in the capital area uh, to, get to, uh, to get to their places of work. And their places of work were, in some cases, actually uh, dual use, uh, electrical uh, power plants uh, and other facilities that were uh, also uh, uh, essential to the military effort. Uh, after a significant amount of work, we were able to uh, convince, uh, actually, most of the work done in Washington that we needed to change, change objectives. There was not universal acceptance of this, uh, but enough that we were able to get more targets on the air tasking order of the, of the type uh, that uh, needed to be hit so that the population of, uh, of Serbia would turn against their own leadership. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, we did bomb the bridge. Were there civilian casualties? Yes, there were. But we got, uh, we got our point across uh, we expanded the target list, um, and we uh, and we were able to get that get that job done. Even as that was happening, even as success was beginning to show itself, air power was being graded on artificial by artificial standards. Our paper was being graded on how many tanks we killed. Remember, I said there were forty thousand troops that went into Kosovo. These forty thousand troops were uh, carrying out genocide with 45 pistols in the heads of villagers. Tanks all had almost nothing to do with it. But the measure of success daily in the briefings to our leadership was how many tanks did we kill? And this actually diverted effort uh, to go try and find tanks and kill tanks uh, rather than try and find the pockets of Serbian forces on the ground that were actually doing the damage to the civilians. Uh, 
By this time, recall that we did have um, uh, JDAM weapons. We did have the ability to uh, precisely guide uh, with GPS that uh, really for the first time, and we were able to put these things, uh, these things to use. It was a mind-boggling disconnect uh, to sit there in Washington, especially to think back on it now, a mind-boggling disconnect between the strategy and the tasks. Uh, the strategy of uh, an operational demonstration hoping for the best versus a, stra a decisive strategy to uh, bend the uh, population's will uh, to a uh, decisive end, uh, a measurement of tanks versus uh, a, a more strategic uh, uh, aim of uh, uh, getting the leadership of, uh, of Serbia to change their mind about uh, their operational objectives in Kosovo. Uh, these things evolved during the course of battle instead of being in place as we uh, started to try uh, to, uh, uh, to bring an end to, the, to that crisis. Allies played a significant role, just as we have heard before. Thirteen nations uh, took, took part. Although uh, the U.S. was probably responsible for more than 90% of the sorties flown in the effort, uh, we had uh, worthy efforts by, uh, by our NATO allies and uh, some groundbreaking ones. It was the first time that the Germans had uh, actually engaged in combat operations since World War II. Uh, it was the first time that uh, NATO had engaged without a, uh, a, the approval of the United Nations Security Council. Uh, it was, it was uh, a bold, uh, a necessary move by the, uh, by the NATO uh, alliance uh, to act against what was obviously um, a genocide. The U.S. chain of command uh, for this, uh, the only word that I've ever been able to think that was appropriate for this is that it was goofy. Uh, we had the Supreme Allied Commander Europe that was exercising uh, uh, overall uh, command and control delegated the responsibility and authority for execution down to a uh, U.S. only branch of Allied Forces South that was commanded by a four-star U.S. Navy Admiral, who then delegated it through his U.S. channels down to Mike Short in the CAOC in Italy, where all the command and control, all the communications background, all the connectivity uh, required to actually be uh, become a, uh, be aware, remain aware of what was going on, and be able to exercise and execute, prosecute the war uh, was was located, and that's where everybody wanted to be. Mike had to put up with a as things progressed, as uh, air power turned from a demonstration into successful prosecution, and we actually saw attitudes changing uh, in Belgrade among the uh, uh, Serbian leadership as we uh, were taking in more refugees across the border uh, from Albania uh, and Kosovo, I mean from Kosovo into Albania, we set up these huge uh, refugee camps uh, that were very successful. As all that was going on and success be began to become evident, you could see the leadership of the, uh, of the operation become more frantic to get ground forces in. And the talk began to escalate about um, uh, how long it would take to get um, a sizable ground force in. Uh, the estimates of a ground force were somewhere around 500,000 uh, people. There was no enthusiasm in Washington or in NATO to put a ground force into this operation. But there was this continued belief that that's what was going to happen. A very interesting set of affairs. Pretty soon, we were pretty sure that we were going to get to our objectives with the use of air power. And uh, well, one of the other things that happened, this is very early in the, in the contest, was um, uh, the commander of Supreme Allied Commander Europe was a, a little bit uh, disgusted that we weren't uh, killing enough tanks. Uh, so we, he ordered a, um, a unit of Apache helicopters to come down and to station themselves in Albania. Uh, even Rick Shinseki, the chief of staff of the army, would tell you today that was a total disaster. Uh, it, uh, it took them two weeks to deploy 24 Apaches down there. The only deaths we had in the air were two Apache pilots, uh, two Apache crew that was killed during a training exercise. 
and later it was discovered that those Apaches were not equipped properly. There was a uh, there were a whole list of things that were not done done uh, well with that with that deployment. Um, on the same air base, the United States Air Force had put in a contingency response group. We had a tent city set up. We had gone out, gone out. We contracted for gravel. All the mud that the Army people were putting up with on their side of the runway, uh, we had fixed on our side. Uh, we were taking uh, uh, people from the Army side until the numbers just got too great. They ended up sending 5,000 people in there with the Army Corps headquarters to support the, uh, the Apache helicopters. The reason they put the Corps headquarters in there was the fear that there would be an agreement for the Apache helicopters to work for the Joint Force Air Component Commander. Uh, and this was an attempt to make sure that that didn't happen. Uh, one of my proudest uh, uh, learning outcomes from that, uh, that conflict was the way Mike Short handled this particular problem. Mike was absolutely brilliant. Uh, he never insisted that the Apache helicopters be under the control of the JFAC. What he did say was that in order to get all the support that the Apache helicopters would need to be successful, that would be search and rescue, that would be uh, jamming, that would be electronic warfare support, that would be the right kind of intelligence, real-time intelligence, et cetera, in order to make uh, that uh, any operation, deep operation with Apache helicopters successful would have to be on the air tasking order. This was molded back and forth. Uh, I know that uh, uh, General Keene back in the uh, Pentagon uh, was uh, very upset that, we, that the Army refused to uh, turn over tactical control of those helicopters, the JFAC. Still, Mike Short never insisted on it. He handled it extremely well. In the end, the Army Apaches never did uh, fly any combat sorties. Uh, what we did benefit from that deployment was that their, uh, their anti-artillery uh, uh, radars uh, really did a great job of helping us uh, spot enemy on the other side of the line and, and isolate uh, small groups that we, we were able to, uh, to go after. Uh, Rick Shinseki, after the conflict, uh, came back and re completely redid the way that uh, the Army now deploys those, those units. Uh, but the U.S. chain of command uh, was uh, not one that we ever want to repeat. Uh, the uh, Allied Forces uh, element, led by the uh, Navy uh, Four Star, uh, was one that uh, focused mo mainly the whole their whole effort uh, th that I saw was an attempt to get a, an aircraft carrier into the into the battle, and they finally ended up getting an aircraft carrier into the battle. Um, the uh, Theodore Roosevelt uh, in, that flew a, um, a very successful raid on the Pristina uh, airport. Um, but it was a very short duration deployment. Um, and again, uh, not really uh, integrated with the air tasking order. So Mike Short's impossible task was to um, try to integrate this diverse set of interests, which he did a brilliant job of. My task was to try to run interference um, for him and try to engineer the shift in strategy from uh, one that was never going to work to one that ended up uh, being the one that did work to uh, focus on the uh, strategic um, objectives of uh, employing the population of Serbia, Serbia uh, to uh, convince Mr. Milosevic uh, to do something else. Uh, even after we were successful, it's interesting to note that uh, uh, the credit for the war uh, was uh, people who did everything they could to make sure the Air Force didn't get credit for what happened. Uh, the commander, Supreme Allied, uh, the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe himself said, well, it was a threat of the, of the uh, impending ground uh, invasion that uh, caused Milosevic to change his mind. Uh, even uh, at the time in Washington, it was uh, made evident and public that there was no support, and there was no support in NATO for a large ground incursion into, into, into the former Yugoslavia. Um, it was said by especially uh, uh, several of the people in, in the UK that it was the Russians who, uh, part of their, uh, their, uh, in, their in political intervention and their uh, 
effort with Finland actually to broker uh, peace talks uh, and to mediate, it was the Russians who, who talked Milosevic into, uh, into capitulating. Well, uh, such talks had been going on for quite a long time. Uh, they, the very same team had been at work before the war started uh, with very little success. And so uh, I have no reason to believe that uh, uh, they would have been any more successful without uh, the intervening, uh, intervening uh, military operation of Operation Allied Force. Um, and it goes on and on. We still hear some of this stuff today uh, about, uh, about Kosovo. It really wasn't air power. Although several did speak up quite loudly and say, this is a, these are a set of conditions in which air power uh, can work. And there are a set of conditions where it makes it, make it much easier for air power to be decisive on its own. One of them is the fact that the population um, and a successful middle class lifestyle in the capital of Serbia did hold sway over the leader. And his position, position was uh, ever weaker uh, as uh, Serbian troops were uh, dying in fairly large numbers. Still in all, uh, we did witness a, geno a genocide. If you look at the uh, after action reports, there are some 100,000 people uh, missing as a result of the operation, uh, as a result of the Serbs coming down into, into Kosovo. Uh, a large number, and uh, even as in Bosnia, um, uh, large graves uh, still are discover being discovered today. So what are some of the lessons we can take away? This is a very broad brush, but what are some of the lessons we can take away? The command and control that was used in actual combat was never organized or practiced in peacetime. It was put together on the spot. It never had a chance of being successful. Through it all, Mike Short was able to rise above all this and work the operation out of the chaos on a day-to-day -day basis to produce a, a successful result even as the strategic objectives were still being argued at higher levels. I didn't have, nor did Mike, because we were doing everything by VTC, everybody was, was, uh, was, uh, was uh, located far from each other. Unlike General Horner, I did not have, we did not have the kind of rapport with the leadership that uh, General Horner was able to establish. Uh, there was never a, a, um, an atmosphere of trust uh, that we had with uh, many of our own leadership. Um, the support and supporting relationships were, were never uh, worked out properly. Um, as I said, the, the, the uh, Allied Forces uh, South staff was working mainly with a protocol staff out of London. Uh, we didn't have an airman on that staff for about 10 days. Bentley Rayburn, General Bentley Rayburn finally uh, showed up and, and began to uh, be the senior airman on that staff. And uh, we began to get some input into what, uh, what they were trying to do. Um, we also saw uh, our senior leadership uh, working around the chain of command. when. Uh, when our senior leadership couldn't get the right answer from the Pentagon, they would go through NATO channels to try and get a different answer. Um, when the senior leadership couldn't talk Mike Short into uh, doing something, uh, they would call me and want me to give orders to General Short, which I, of course, refused to do. Uh, on one occasion, it was... Uh, 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 a request to do something that was uh, absolutely ridiculous. I said, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, I'm not going to ask General Short to do that. And the answer was, well, General Short said the same thing. So, uh, we, uh, we must find a way in the future to get our command and control squared away and to be able to practice it, put it together, make it reliable, and be able to create the kind of conditions that General Horner was able to create where you actually have uh, a face-to-face -face relationship with, uh, with your leadership. We never were able to do that successfully uh, in, this, in this 78 days of this conflict. Uh, the idea of Task Force Hawk was, uh, ended up being a huge drain on resources. We flew 512 C-17 sorties out of Ramstein into Albania to put this core headquarters in there. 
with a large number of tanks, uh, armored personnel carriers, um, multiple launch rocket system, which was supposed to cleanse the way of the Apache helicopters, just scorch the earth in front of the helicopters as they did deep penetration. That was never going to happen. Um, and those assets sat virtually unpacked on the runway for the entire duration of the, of the operation. Um, there were some good things that happened. We got to exercise what I thought was uh, a good initial showing of the Air Expeditionary Force idea, where we had uh, people identified, ready to deploy on the shortage of specialties you could reach forth into, uh, into other uh, uh, buckets of the Air Expeditionary Force and pull the specialties forward so that you have a, uh, a complete team when you arrived. Um, they were there and prepared to uh, stay for uh, 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 four months was the plan, but could have stayed longer if, if they'd had to. That was a good showing. We were able to uh, work our time critical targeting in ways that we had not been able to do before. Um, we were the victim of bad habits, and uh, I, went, Mike, I went down with Mike, and Mike, I said, what are you having trouble with? And Mike said, well, the time critical targeting is, is, is just a problem. Well, you go back in the time critical targeting cell, and there in the, uh, in the Xerox machine is a picture of an SA-6, and it was taken at 5 o'clock that morning. And uh, this SA-6, we knew it was going to move every six hours. And you ask a simple question, what are we doing to get this thing? Oh, well, we'll put it into the end basket of the uh, people on the ops floor. I said, well, it's, it's not here by now. Yeah, that is a problem. They sort of move every six hours. Really? So I took my aide, uh, then Major Teresa Fitzpatrick, who's absolutely dynamite intel uh, targeteer, and I left her there. And I said, Mike, can I leave Teresa here? He said, that would be wonderful. I did. She took over, and within about three days, we were killing SA-6s. I also took the group of lieutenants I had at Ramstein, and I said, get in touch with the chaos down there and help them do a little bit of, of targeteering on, and, and predictive analysis on where these SA-6s are. So uh, by the day after tomorrow, in the morning, I want you to come tell me where these SA-6s that I have pictures of right here, where are they going to be? Lieutenants show up uh, day after tomorrow and say, well, sir, we know uh, this one and this one. This fellow right here lives in this village. He goes to back to his village between each deployment, and uh, he'll be here at 5 a.m. And he was, and, and they had already coordinated, and we got that guy. This is the kind of involved stuff that needs to be happening in air power in order to make us effective. What we were dealing with for, before that was a strategic reconnaissance community who was used to um, working in a Cold War nuclear environment where you popped the cork on the champagne when the picture arrived, not when the target was dead. It takes us a while to examine our own conscience and find these vulnerabilities and go out and fix them. That's what we've got to do. Um, the uh, unmanned air vehicle, uh, Hal talked about it earlier, the Predator UAV. Uh, Buzz Mosley, uh, Hal, uh, myself, and others were uh, a large part of getting that uh, pr program going. During Kosovo, uh, what became evident is that the UAV was sitting there looking at targets. We had no way to pass the, inter the information. The intel community owned the UAV. The operators owned the air assets with the bombs. There was no proper connection. We fixed it. And so we did. We put a laser. Within two weeks, we had a way to do, put a laser designator on a, on, a, on, a, on a Predator. Now, sadly, the war ended before we actually got to use that thing, but it, we were able to do it. Laser, later, I came back as a commander of Air Combat Command, said, how are we doing about putting laser designators on the Predator? They said, oh, sir, we took them all off because it's not in the program. <laughs> I said, well, I have an idea. Let's put them back on, okay? And let, not only that, what we're doing, let's see if we can put a Hellfire missile on there so when we find things, we can actually do something about it. Ownership issues, et cetera, they all intervened with that, but we, we finally got that done. Uh, the JDAM, uh, the GPS-guided bomb, had its debut in, in Kosovo with a B-2, and you see the pictures of a string of JDAMs right down the center line of the bridge. It worked. And uh, this was its debut. Little operation in St. Charles, uh, uh, Missouri, uh, right next to the old McDonnell Douglas plant. Uh, a very small room with about uh, a dozen people in it cranking out JDAM kits. Uh, I stopped by there on one of my trips back home, showed them a bunch of pictures of, uh, of their work, and they were absolutely thrilled with uh, what they were doing for America. 
uh, a great small team doing its job. The B-2 debuted. It was a struggle to get the B-2 in the fight. Nobody wanted to put the B-2 in the fight. Why? We were afraid it was going to get shot down. Come on. Come on. We argued that through. We got that, we got that done. Um, combat search and rescue. We saw the rescue of, uh, of the F-117 pilot and of uh, Dave Goldfein, who was flying the uh, F-16. Superb demonstration of leadership. In the F case of the F-117, that night just happened to be on, uh, on alert that night, uh, Captain John Cherry, young captain, United States Air Force, uh, fighter weapons school graduate, uh, takes off with his four ship of A-10s when we get word that the uh, F-117 has gone down. Uh, he calmly goes up and organizes a complete CSAR effort. I was listening to the whole thing on the radio. Of course, when the, uh, when, the, um, uh, when the airplane gets shot down, the first top two rows of my red switch go off, and uh, I'm answering uh, phone calls from the top uh, leadership. And um, John Cherry begins to organize things. You just hear him. He's putting, he's putting assets on the tankers. He's rotating them on and off the tankers. He's moving the joint stars into the position where he thinks the down pilot is. He's uh, working uh, the, the, um, the, the AWACS to keep his uh, situation awareness up. Uh, he's taking probes in to see what the uh, ground resistance is going to be. This all takes time. And uh, we didn't have the position right the first time, so an hour turns into two, turns into three. And finally, I get a call from a very senior member in the, in the command chain that says, Jumper, I need you to get in and take charge of this. Uh, this is not going well. Uh, we're going to take a lot of heat for this. F-117s are supposed to be shot down. You've got to take charge of it. And I said, no, I'm not. Captain John Cherry, A-10 pilot, is the most qualified person on the universe to execute this operation. He is in charge. He's doing a magnificent job, and if anybody on Earth can get this young uh, F-117 pilot out, this guy can, and we're going to let him do his job. That, the rest of that exchange did not go well, but that's, the, that's what we did. And we got, we, got the, we got the 117. Turns out the 117 guy on the ground is the guy that wrote the doctrine in the F-117 for combat search and rescue, so he did everything exactly right by the book, and uh, we were able to easily, when we finally located him, plug, plug, uh, get in and, get, and pluck him out. Um, the Contingency Response Group. When we first started off, we opened 18 bases in NATO, 18 bases. Uh, this uh, argues against those who say, well, you know, you're going to have a, uh, be denied uh, base rights. Well, when, uh, when the security of a, of, a, of a region is at stake, you're not de denied base rights. You're invited in, welcomed in, actually. And actually, too many people want to participate, which is the, what we were struggling with. But what we had was a base survey mechanism that was much too cumbersome to serve uh, a rapid deployment of the type that we advertised for many years that we could do. Uh, a survey team would show up. It was hastily put together. It was uh, put together by a command back in the United States because that's, that's their mission. They come over. They only have about half of the people that they need. They aren't able to answer critical questions. They go home. We're going to have to send the rest later. It's going to be two weeks, three weeks before we can get this done. Not acceptable. We opened the contingency response group at Ramstein Air Base, and we put qualified people from a bunch of specialties in there. Uh, we actually uh, ended up getting them all jump qualified. They could go into uh, bases uh, very quickly uh, and make an instant assessment of what was needed. And these are the people that went around and got our bases open, 18 bases uh, around NATO. These are the kinds of ground, we call them, uh, you know, these are, these are the kind of ground warrior skills that we need in order to prosecute our business. If we think of what we're rewarded for, what the public thinks of us as, a, as an Air Force, it's our kinetic capability. It's our ability to rapidly deploy, to sustain, our, sustain ourselves, protect ourselves, engage the enemy in a very lethal way, and then get, to get the hell out when we're supposed to. Between engagements, between wars, all of that stuff that goes along with support, the civil engineering, the security forces, the support forces, all atrophies until the next conflict and we have to crank it up again. Uh, this is, a, I think, a major deficiency we, we need to, to address because it's, ha it's happened again. There are core mission elements in our Air Force that we need to acknowledge, and they, are more to, they have more to do than just flying airplanes and dropping bombs. You've got to be able to fix them, deploy to a location, sustain them, 
protect them and get them home. And finally, I'm going to end up with, uh, there are a lot of war stories to tell. I mean, we did bomb the Chinese embassy, those of you who remember that. Yes, we did. We bombed the Chinese embassy. We had the uh, case of the, uh, the uh, three soldiers that were, were captured on the, uh, in Macedonia. That uh, was a, a, an interesting story. Lots of interesting story to tell. Let me close by saying this. You've heard a little bit of this from the stage today, too. Uh, to the cadets here uh, assembled, uh, you, uh, your learning is just beginning. Uh, I remember back to my days when I was studying electrical engineering at VMI and I thought I was going to graduate uh, with this uh, vast storehouse of knowledge. And whatever knowledge I had uh, turned out to be uh, really mostly irrelevant to the rest of my life. And my learning uh, barely departed the x-axis on the graph uh, compared with my march through life, which everything I did in the Air Force was almost a vertical learning experience. Do not take yourselves too seriously. The greatest leaders this nation ever had had one major characteristic and that was their selflessness. George Washington, George C. Marshall. Study them. Study George C. Marshall. The job they were doing at the moment was the most important thing to them, and they did it to the best of their ability. They weren't always completely successful, but they always gave it their best. You have this marvelous opportunity. Take full advantage of it, and it will serve you well. Don't ever think it's about you. Every person here, if any person here had, had to pick out sort of the next thing they were going to do in their career, or we try to plan it out, uh, carefully, uh, we would have gotten it wrong almost every time. I know I would have. You want to know the key to success? I'll tell you exactly what it is. You do the job you have right now the best you possibly can, and you'll be stunned at how lucky you get. So thank you very much for having me. I do appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. That was thank terrific. You. Terrific. Uh, I'm sure there will be some questions for General Jumper. And I think he's, uh, he's... I'm mic'd up and ready to go. Mic'd up and ready to General go. General Jumper, thank you very much. My name is Steve Bass. This is my second question of the day. I'll try to watch the number. I used to fly bombers, and I want to ask a sort of a non-specific question. I was familiar with targeting from the PSYOP, but I'm more of a student of history. And if you study history, particularly World War II, you can't help but reach the conclusion that there's a lot of wasted effort in bombing targets that aren't really that important or are difficult to strike. The lesson of World War II is there's two broad classes of target that need to be gone after initially, and one is transportation and the other is energy. Energy, not just POL, but uh, the electrical grid. And that if you destroy those targets, enough of them, you'll collapse the enemy's economy and he won't be able to maintain even a civilian economy, let alone the uh, war effort. So uh, when I hear about people you know, going after mobile, difficult to attack, low-level military targets or trying to strike manufacturing facilities when you don't need to strike manufacturing facilities, all you have to do is destroy the power source to that manufacturing facility as was done in World War II. I think that if there's sort of strategic guidance at the beginning of bombing campaigns, you could really narrow the, the target list to the most important ones, maybe delete a lot of them. And I think this is more important, uh, particularly when you have larger countries uh, that have better defenses and larger economies. And it's, it doesn't apply if you're playing whack-a-mole in the Middle East or going after some ragtag militia. But if you're going against a real country, I think that's the way to go and not try to go after the, you know, 16,000 factories that are located in some province somewhere. Thank you. Uh, I think General Horner said it best, uh, every war is different. Uh, I think the single, probably the single most leveraging target we hit in Belgrade was the cigarette factory that was owned by Milosevic's fact, uh, family. And uh, when the Serbs, uh, who are a largely a smoking nation, about 70 percent, were no longer able to get cigarettes, it had a significant effect on their influence on their leadership to change the situation. 
It had nothing to do with industrial might, um, uh, and we did, by the way, hit the electrical power grids as well, uh, but uh, it had to do with what it took to change the minds of the population who still held sway over their leadership. Uh, th this is certainly different than World War II, where that proved to be, as General uh, Horner said, completely different uh, uh, situation. Uh, but you do have to look at every, uh, at every situation. I, I, I agree with you. There's, there's very little uh, in going out and trying to uh, uh, nickel-dime a target set. And when we get out, let ourselves get into that, it is the least productive kind of use of air power we can, uh, we can, uh, we can perform. Uh, but there are more organized ways to think about it uh, in the kind of warfare we're fighting today, and that's what we always have to go after, realizing that every conflict is different. But I, generally, I agree with you. Next question. Yes, sir. Uh, C1C Blaze Music, uh, in regards to your ground warrior skills and keeping everyone ready for war, uh, how could we go about doing that when we have a political system that kind of, I say slightly, screws us over or a retainment issue in the Air Force? Uh, well, we went, through a, uh, we went through a period where we had some excellent ground skills. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, Coleman, who uh, ran our security uh, forces in the Air Force, uh, we had the best firing ranges uh, of any of the services. Uh, we, had, uh, uh, we had exercises that uh, uh, tested our, our, our soldier skills. And believe me, every service needs some level of soldiering skills. Uh, we, had, we were doing a very, very good job of that. Um, the retention, uh, uh, as was spoken about before, uh, in, the current, in our current state uh, has a lot to do with the resources we put against training. Uh, as we lose our technological advantage, the advantage we still have is our training advantage. If we begin to let that erode, which we had done, uh, then we get into the situation you're talking about. Uh, when we are able to demonstrate to ourselves and others uh, that uh, we can uh, deploy ourselves, we can defend ourselves, we can get bombs on target, uh, we can sustain ourselves, uh, and uh, we have the engineering resources to uh, make bases uh, able, to be, uh, able to be used in remote locations. When we demonstrate those kinetic skills that are uh, valued by the population, believe me, morale very quickly follows. And I hope we are able to put some of these resources against uh, a, uh, a revival of those skills. Yes. Good afternoon, Dan Burke, 710th Operations Group of Buckley Air Force Base. I'm in uh, space operations and we're in the midst of quite a bit of transition as we go from operating in a peaceful environment to getting ready for the threats of FACES. And uh, what concern I have is that we're, we're growing up in an era where uh, the operational level is very well defined and very mature. And so we tend to look out there and grab on to that operational level as the holy grail of what we need to get to, sometimes at the expense of tactical training. So worrying, uh, especially with the story of, of Captain Cherry, what advice would you give us as a space community as to how we should properly divide our efforts between getting the operational level right and getting the tactical level right? Well, the first thing we have to realize in today's, days, today's age of warfare is that there, uh, the lines are almost completely blurred now between the tactical, operational, and strategic levels of war. Uh, when you have a Predator UAV putting Hellfire missile on the number two guy in uh, the terrorist organization on a road uh, coming out of a compound in Yemen, uh, that is a very, the most tactical asset in the world getting the most strategic result. Uh, so we have, to, we have to make sure that we understand that space, when applied, I think, as it has not been yet, but we're still striving for, will be very much more tactical than it is today, or it was back when I was dealing with it. I tell the story of the guy who showed up from, um, from, a, from a place in Denver into the, uh, into the um, uh, chaos in... Uh, 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 operate in, 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 not in Desert Storm, but in um, the 2003 uh, operation. What is it? Iraqi Freedom. Iraqi Freedom, sorry. Uh, he shows up with his kit, and much like the story you heard before, I, I go down and visit, and, uh, and there's, a, there's a black curtain pulled around him and his screen back in the corner, and the two burly guards standing outside. 
Uh, and after a quick discussion, we find out that the, the reason two belly guards are out there is because of all the, the very classified names that are pasted on the screen around the, uh, around the set. And the dot that is being generated, we can put out on the, without any further explanation, out on the big board where it will be most useful. This guy, who we called the guy who had thick glasses, lived in the basement and had no life, <laughs> because that's what he called himself, uh, was probably the most valuable person in the chaos for uh, a long period of time. He refused to come back to uh, Washington to receive a award that we wanted to give him. Uh, he didn't want to leave his post. So this is the per this person realized the tactical benefit of space in a way that I'm not sure we fully captured, but have to capture. Uh, it gets to the kind of training and the in our, in our culture and our background, and the culture of space, quite frankly, is not one of the wing commander sitting at the top of the table saying, "Why am I launching these things into space? Where is my constellation of satellites, uh, mini sats, or whatever I'm going to throw up over a uh, a place to get to a constant coverage?" It's it's not been integrated the way the rest of uh, of our elements of power have, been, have done. I think we still have to work on that. Uh, and it's guys like you, the leadership now, that have to uh, make sure you understand uh, how the Air Force goes to war and make sure that what you have fits into that. We've made great progress, don't get me wrong, we've made great progress. It, uh, you know, back from the days where you couldn't, get a, uh, you couldn't get a picture of your target because it was too classified for you who were about to get in an airplane and go fly, couldn't see it, we, we've come a long way. Uh, but we got a long way to go too. And I ask that you and your generation and the generations that follow you take space to the next level. I think that's what we got to do. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, Ed Hurlick, class of 80. Ed. So, given that a plan rarely survives first contact, which weapon system proved maybe surprisingly effective and which one may be surprisingly ineffective? Uh, in the Kosovo situation, of course, we were trying a whole lot of new things. And I'll ask Rebecca, actually, had me, uh, help me out here, because Rebecca's uh, actually looked at this stuff. Uh, the B-2 and the JDAM, of course, uh, there was great worry about that, and both of them worked very well. Uh, there was great worry about putting the B-1 into combat. We put the B-1 into combat with some very special systems on it. They were actually the test crews, the ones that flew the missions, uh, extremely successful. Um, we put the Predator to work there, but the Predator, and the Predator did what it was supposed to do, but, it, but there wasn't a closed loop during the course of the war, so you couldn't take advantage of all that you were learning from the Predator. You couldn't take advantage of it in the real time it was producing for you. So that was, it's not a disappointment, it was just, we, we, we should have been ahead of that problem, and we weren't. Um, and then, of course, you have the, the, the disappointments of not being able to get bases open quickly enough, uh, uh, the, uh, the, some of the frictions with the Allies over uh, prerogatives. Uh, we, we saw um, members of the Alliance uh, actually uh, turning their crews back who were about to get ready into cockpits to go fly on missions because the political leadership disapproved the targets. Uh, those kinds of things that should be worked out in alliance settings well in advance, we, we had to deal with a lot, of, a lot of those frictions. Most of all, I think that we showed well. Uh, we need to learn more from and fix what we, what we didn't do well. Terrific. Good afternoon, sir, and uh, thank you for coming. My name is C2C John Gazinski. And I was wondering, you talked about that, that cell that was sending up pictures of SA-5s and it was sitting on the Xerox machine. I'm sure you've been in a position um, throughout your career where you thought, or you look at the task you've been given and thought, this doesn't make sense. Um, how do you think is the best way to improve that process or maybe change the culture or change the habits of an organization to make it more efficient and effective? Well, General Horner hit on this uh, very well. Uh, You've got to address these problems up front. You can't let them uh, fester to the point that they're affecting the, your ability to uh, execute your operation. So when things come down that don't make sense, uh, you know, in Kosovo, for instance, we, we were already started by the time that things became evidence that, that didn't make sense. And we had to readdress those things, or many of them, in the course of battle. 
but when you're setting your strategic objectives and you're, 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 you're writing out your concept of operations, that is the time to make sure that your relationships are, uh, are, are, are set and you uh, confront those that you absolutely know won't work. Largely done by people who are personally removed from the operation and are dealing with theory uh, or what they'd really rather have. I saw a whole lot of, uh, how many airplanes is this going to take? Is Cerner's going to take, uh, you know, 500 airplanes? Well, give me 250s worth of that. You know, it, it, that, that sort of, let, 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 let's bargain on, on what it's going to take to do, do the job. And we, we, air commanders who are confident, who are transparent, and know their work, will confront the leadership that tries to steer them in the wrong direction. Uh, that's what commanders do. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Well, General Jumper, thank you very much. Uh, since you told us history is important, can you just take a moment and tell us about the Museum of the American Revolution? It's only been open about a year. It's been open about a year. This is about not just George Washington and the iconic figures of the American Revolution. Uh, we're trying to sweep up that period between, like, after the Seven Years' War, between about 1760 and 1790, where the nation was really formed, and all of the, all of the heated debate about how this nation would take shape uh, uh, among not only the founding fathers, but uh, among the, the, the colonies that were, in, in, you remember when the Revolutionary War starts, the colonies, many of the colonies distrust and hate each other more than they hate the British. As a matter of fact, if you could characterize it, the colonies were, were finding ways to remain loyal to the British instead of, instead of going to war until they were pushed to the brink. And these powerful figures emerge that write these magical words that propel a nation and remain relevant over 250 years that bring us to where we are today. Who are these people? How were they educated? How did they grow up? Most of them did not have a formal education. Yet they could transition from a musket to a pulpit to great oratory and then sit down and write these unbelievably powerful words that emerged just at the right time. If you look through the history, if you think there's not another hand at work, you look at the history of the United States into World War II, and here comes George C. Marshall, here comes Dwight Eisenhower, here comes Winston Churchill. They come at just the right time. Now, we have a few uh, conflicts that uh, I wish we'd have some of those kind of people emerge at the right time. Uh, they weren't there, I don't know what happened. We gotta talk to the big guy about that. Uh, <laughs> we may need some help, but. Let me ask Rebecca, Rebecca has been totally immersed in, in uh, the subjects of the Air Force uh, ever since I've known her. And uh, Rebecca, when you reflect on Operation Allied Force, I mean, what are your two, one or two big takeaways? Well, I'm, I'm honored to have the, had the chance to, uh, to research that, but I take away the fact that it was a great success for NATO. Had this operation failed, and you don't take perhaps as much credit as you should, but uh, it was necessary for you to bring triple the number of forces into the theater, to open up all those bases. If NATO had failed after that initial three days, we would not have that strong alliance today. I think that's a huge takeaway. And then as you talked about, it planted the seeds and really brought them into the initial stage of the chaos as a weapon system, your phrase, the integration of ISR with strike, and pointed the way towards what we would see in the next 10 to 15 years. You did a great job. Thank you very much. You see why I like this lady. <laughs> Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.